Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. But I'm excited um, that you're with us today. It's going to be a, a great service. And we, we started a new series last week, Back to the Basics. And if you've been with us just the past couple of Sundays, we've just been going through really what the church is meant to be, really just the basics of what the church is meant to be. And again, basics is defined, basic is defined as the essential facts or principles of a subject or skill. So we're going back to like the, the early church, what they did, how their community looked, what they did for each other. And, you know, it's been really good. I mean, it's just good for me. I'm just researching and learning, you know, just more and more about what the local and early church used to look like. Um, and we're going to be, we've been spending all our time, you know, we've just been going through Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So that's what we went through the first week. We went through that verse, and we talked about uh, how important teaching is, how important fellowship is, and how important prayer is. And then last week, we went through this verse, and it says in verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And we went really just to what signs and wonders are, who they're for, are they for today. We went through all of that. So I want to encourage you, if you miss it, go check it out. Uh, it's really simple. Like, again, like, this is so basic. Like, I'm not, you might not be blown away by what I'm saying, but I think we're just going back to the very, like, basic level of what this all is, a deep sense of awe. And then in verse 44, it says this, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple with great uh, they, they, they worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved, right? This is the basic, what the church is supposed to be, really the basic of what it started as. And so this is really what I think, you know, we need to go back to. It's just this, the simplicity and the basics of sharing and worshiping and praying and eating together, like, like enjoying each other's company. And so what we're going to go today, we've just been going verse by verse, but we're going to be going through uh, verse 44 and 45 today. And this is what it says. It says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So if we want to go back to the basics of church, Generosity has to be at the core of it. Generosity has to be a big part of what we are about. And I'm not talking about, you know, like tithing. I'm not talking about, you know, giving that way. I'm talking about at the core essence of who we are is we're supposed to be generous with one another. And not just with one another. It also says with those in need. So not just those of us who call Known Victory Church home, not just for us, but it's, we're supposed to be generous for our city. We're supposed to be generous for our families and for our workplaces. Like, we're supposed to be people where generosity follows us wherever we go. Generosity is the core, one of the core things that makes us different than the world. So what I want to do today, I want to give us three um, parts of what generosity is. I want to, I want to just share, like, again, really basic. But the, the first thought I have for us today is this, is that generosity is a lifestyle, not a moment. Generosity isn't supposed to be something we do. It's supposed to be who we are. It's supposed to be like the essence of who we are as followers of Jesus. Not just like, yeah, I, you know, I, I gave one time or I served in this way and it's like one time. No, it's supposed to be part of the core of who we actually are. Just because you give, that actually doesn't necessarily mean you're generous. Generosity comes from our heart, not from our wallet. It comes from, from our heart. And where our heart is, there our treasure is also. God is more concerned about our heart than he is about anything else. You know, generosity has nothing to do with your income or status. You know, some of the most generous people that I have ever come across are those who don't actually have very much. You know, I went on a, a trip 
I've been on a few mission trips in my life, and if you've ever been to another country across the world and stepped into a place where people have a lot less than me, but they're a lot more generous than me, have you ever had a moment like that? I remember we went to this one village, and you know the 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 the, the average income was probably not very high, but I remember we showed up and they had a feast prepared for us, like an absolute feast, and so we ate this meal. I don't know what I was eating. I'll be completely honest. I have no idea. And it was like good. It was like super spicy, but it was good. See, it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what your status is. It really matters is who you are. It has nothing to do with your income or your status. I know a lot of people who have a lot and they're some of the least generous people that I know. And we've know, we know both kinds of people. And I believe as believers, we're supposed to become just generous in everything that we do. And Jesus clearly sees this in this moment in Luke chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, it says this, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. And then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. See, Jesus is really trying to tell his disciples in this moment Again, it's not about your income. It's, it's more about who you are. That generosity is not supposed to be a moment. It's supposed to be a lifestyle. She gave everything that she had. You know, I think true generosity comes not from the amount that we give. I, I don't think it comes from the amount that we give. It really just comes again. And I'm saying this a lot because it's the basics. Our heart in it. You know, there's so many scriptures about generosity. I don't have time to go through them all, but it's like don't give with a reluctant heart. Give with a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Some of us, we're only generous because we feel like we have to be, not because we want to be. We have to be like, like the essence of who we are has to be generous. You know, all that Jesus asks, he says, bring me what you have. And we see, again, another moment where this is so true. Jesus, he he's, was around his very hungry friends in a very hungry crowd. Some of this is like your after-church experience with your young kids. Hangry. Your, your young kids, maybe even your spouse. Maybe it's even you. And Jesus is in this moment where there's a lot of people, and they're like hangry, and they're, they're angry, and they're like hungry, and they're like, like, like they don't know what to do. Again, this might be a moment you've experienced before, but in Mark chapter 6, it says this, late in the afternoon, his disciples came and said to him, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. I love this part. But Jesus said, you feed them. Watch what they say. With what? <laughs> We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. And then he goes, how much bread do you have? He asked, he said, go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And now imagine, I, I can just imagine them sheepishly going to Jesus, right? Like, you asked us to go, we found some, but like, it's not enough. Like, it, it's not enough food. Like, like, this isn't even enough to feed like the boys, right? Like, it's not like, we're gonna keep this for us, send them to the villages, we're gonna take this, we're gonna, like, that's probably how my mind would go. And then in verse 39, and then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups and on the grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could contribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish, and a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Now, again, we, we, most of us, we know this story. Like, we've heard this story preached, like, a ton of times. We know this story really well. But there's very, very important things that, that Jesus says. He says, number one, he says, you feed them. Or when it comes to generosity, Jesus is looking at us saying, you feed them. You feed them. And then they're like, and we, this is what we say. We say, but God, like, Jesus, I don't have anything. Like, how am I supposed to meet the needs in my city? How am I supposed to meet the needs? I don't have anything. We would have to work for months to meet this need. And then Jesus says this next thing, what do you have? And they're like, I don't know. He's like, go and find out. 
I want to encourage you when it comes to your life, I want to encourage you to do an inventory check on actually what you have. I think for a lot of us, why we feel like we can't be generous, then one of the main reasons why we feel this way is because we're not actually grateful enough. When we look around, we see nothing. The disciples, they looked and said, I don't have food. I don't have money. They got to go out to the town. So Jesus says, go and find out what we have. We need to learn what we actually have because what we have has value. When we bring our little and put it into his hands, it actually becomes abundant. And some of us, we look at our little and say, I got to keep on to it. I got to hold on to it. But if we share it, God will take it and bring it to the masses and change the world. Sometimes we feel like we're so little and so insignificant and we become so insecure that what happens is we're not willing to be generous. He says, you feed them. Give him what you have. He's not asking for any more than that. He's asking for what you have. What do you have? Go and find out. You know, we, we hear all these things all the time, and I've said all these things in time. Like, I'll give more, I'll be more generous when I finally get the pay raise, right? I'll give more time once my kids are older. I can give more of myself, you know, once my kids graduate. I know I'll start, I'll start serving in the community when I have more time, and the reality is you'll never have more time. You know, I'll only give when I have more money. You're probably not going to have more money. All that's going to happen is you're going to have more spending. We will never have more time and we will never have more money to get started when it comes to living a life that is dedicated to generosity and meeting the needs of our city and of our communities. And the question we have to ask ourselves is where is my heart towards people? Am I so focused, and I'm talking to me, am I so focused on myself that I'm losing sight of the need in my city, the need in my family? So that's number one. Number two is generosity goes against culture. And I don't know if you've noticed this, But culture teaches us that the more we have, the more value we have, right? The newer car, the more valuable I am. The more prestigious I am. The more happy I will be. The more I have, the more happy I'll be. Once I get the new thing or once I get the next thing, we're always searching for the new and the next thing. And that's what culture teaches us. The more we can acquire, the more we can attain, the more people will like me. The more happy I'll be. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen two toddlers running, running after each other, chasing after one single toy. Ever seen that? And the, the thing is, there's a million toys. But they're literally chasing each other around, wanting the one toy that they haven't played with in over a year. Because the other kid found it, and like, that's mine! And so they start chasing them. And it becomes absolute chaos in a home when you have some toddlers ripping around trying to steal toys from each other. This is my entire life, I feel. And sometimes I'm the one chasing my kid around, like, drop it! That's my laptop, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? It becomes absolutely insane, and it's almost maddening to watch this happen, right? And as one kid takes a toy out of the pile of toys and looks at the other child and has it in their arms and looks at it and starts running away. And then the other kid sees it like, I got to get my revenge. I got to avenge my toy. And they start chasing them around the room. They finally catch them. They rip it out of their hand. That kid's screaming. The one's like, I finally did it. I'm so proud. They start chasing each other. And you're like, make it stop. Make it stop. You know, one thing I've realized in life is that it's really hard for children to share, but you know what's even harder sometimes? For adults to share. Right? There's a song, sharing is caring, oh, sharing is fun. You've probably heard it a million times I have. That's a lesson we got to learn as well. Really, generosity and sharing, really, if you think about the core of it, we're called to share. But what if I don't have enough, Right? So questions we always ask ourselves is, what if? And I think as humans, we have this tendency to ask the what if on the negative side, right? What if I give and I don't have enough? What if you give and you have more than enough? I think we have to change the paradigm. We have to have a paradigm shift in our minds of what God is capable to do. Again, he says, you feed them. You know, God had already made it rain bread from heaven for years, 
He could have done it a different way, but he says, you feed them. He's saying, you see the need? Go and do it. Bring me what you have. Bring it to me. I'll bless it. And then it's going to spread farther than you could ever even imagine. You feed them. You know, as adults, when it comes to sharing, it might be a different language, but it's the same heart issue. Is that if you take it from me, if I give it to you, that puts me at a disadvantage, and now I don't have enough. I was doing some research this week on financial goals. What are the financial goals that people have? And it's, it's very fascinating because there's a lot of really good goals that people have when it comes to their finance. I think it's amazing. And what are the priorities? And some of the common answers, and maybe this is even to look at your own life, some of the financial goals you have, it might be, you know, you want to you wanna retire early, right? That's a pretty common, you know, I want to retire early. Or maybe you want to pay off your mortgage early, or you want to buy a rental property. You want to start investing. You want to start paying off all your debt. All these things are incredible. Those are all financial goals that are great to set up, and they create a better future, and they set you up for financial freedom, But the interesting thing that I see about a lot of financial goals that all of us have is that the only thing that they have in common is that usually they're all about us. They're not about how I can bless people. It's about how can I bless myself? And there's this leadership expert. His name's John Maxwell. Maybe you know John Maxwell. He's once asked, he was speaking to Microsoft and they did like a Q and A and someone asked him what his financial goals were. They asked him like, what's your financial goals? He said, you don't want to know. And of course, as soon as someone says you don't want to know, you want to know even more, right? So they're like, tell us, like, they're expecting something to like blow their minds, right? He's literally like, he's, they're like, what do you mean you don't want to know? He's like, they're very different than what your goals will be, right? And so, so he tells them this, he says, you know, they're going to be different than, than your goals. And then this is what he says. He said, the only financial goals I have in my life is giving all of my money away before I die. He went on to say, and he was joking, but he said, went on to say that when you die, you don't take it with you. And then he said this, and I still find this so fascinating. He says, he says, do your giving while you're living so you know where it's going. Do your giving while you're living so you know where it's going. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says this. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Why? Because it's so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good and they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. So for me, when I looked in my life, and this is like a recent thing, like I'm not, I'm not like, I've been doing this for 50 years, you know, like no. But I'm really trying to shift my focus when it comes to even just my own personal financial goals. Of course, you know, taking care of my family, of course. But what if my goals when it came to my finances, it was more about blessing other people than just trying to keep it all for myself. What if? And I'm not saying, you know, don't invest. I'm not saying don't retire early. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if we can learn to be generous, if we can learn to have our goals be about blessing other people and not just me, it's really, really important and this is another thing John Maxwell said that I thought was so fascinating. He says this. When, he says, most people are preoccupied, preoccupied by increasing their standard of living. He says, but I think that we need to be more preoccupied by increasing our standard of giving. You know, a lot of us, we look at culture. Again, we've talked about it. We look at culture. It's all about, you know, how can I make my life better? How can I make my life more easy? How can I make my life better? And again, I'm not saying like, don't have great financial goals. I'm not saying that. But what if our focus was, how can I increase my standard when it comes to giving? And again, I'm not talking about tithing. I'm I'm talking about how do we create a lifestyle of generosity everywhere we go? So this is a question I'm starting to ask myself every morning is, how can I add value to someone today? How can I, who can I give to today? And it, it might not be money. It might just be your time. It might just be a shoulder to cry on. It might just be a meal at your home. I think once we learn this and do our best to master it, it has the power to change our lives and to change our relationships, to change our world. Because again, if we go back to the basis, it says that the early church shared everything they had. And this is before they talked about giving money to the poor. They're just talking about their things. Like they just shared it all. They just shared it all. Not just their finances, but their time and their expertise and their food and their clothing and their shelter. And then the last thought I have today is, is this, is that generosity mirrors God's love. You know, when I, was, when I was a kid, 
my mom, she would, she liked to cook. She still does. I'm not saying like just when I was a kid and she, she gave up on it. No. She, she, and but think about my mom, and I don't know if you're this way. When she was younger, she always had to follow the recipe to a T. Like if it was like, if she didn't have the ingredients, she would leave everything and go buy it. And this was back in the day, really before like credit cards and debit cards. And so she needed, in her recipe, she needed to have a little bit of wine for her recipe. My mom doesn't drink alcohol at all. So what she did is she goes, um, she couldn't find any cash. So she went to my, my brother's uh, piggy bank and took out some cash to buy this bottle of wine. And as my mom goes into the, this, the, the liquor store, my brother is screaming and crying. And he's saying this, but mommy, that's my money. And so my mom is carrying the screaming infant in a store with a bottle of wine. And he's saying, that's my money, mom. Horrible moment. And my mom's crying too. She's like, I swear it's, it's for a recipe. I swear it's for a recipe. She's crying in the store. <laughs> you know, and I find that funny because, you know, when you think about life, I think we, we go through life. As if what we have is ours, but the reality is it's God's. You know who probably gave my brother that money? Probably my mom, right? She probably put like a loony in there, you know, like a couple pennies. We go through life as if everything we own is ours. The reality is we're just borrowing it. And our responsibility is to be generous wherever we go. And this is what <clears throat> the writer here of 1 John says. He says it pretty bluntly. He says this, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? These are the type of verses that like you don't see, you know, on billboards, right? You don't see this like tattooed on people's bodies, you know? How can God's love be in that person? So when I read that, I'm like, oh, poof. I better... I better learn to live with compassion towards people because that's how we show God's love and generosity. You know, I think one of the best ways for me to determine how much I love God is by looking at how much I'm willing to give. And again, I'm not talking about an amount. I'm talking about the essence of who we are, the lifestyle of love. And when we see his children hurting and broken and we are not moved by compassion, are we really mirroring his love and generosity? You know, God himself, and we say this, but God himself gave the greatest gift humanity could ever ask for. He gave himself. He was so much more generous than, than I will ever be. And my response has to be, how can I show this same love and compassion to the people who need it most in our world? Again, giving has little to do with money. I believe all of us have something to give. And I believe that that gift has the power to bring people closer to Jesus. There's one thing I love about church, about local church, about our church, is that we come together, broken people. And we come with our talent, we come with our expertise, we come with it all and we share it with each other. If we know someone's in need in our church, like, like our response, and I'm learning, like I'm growing and learning personally, how can we serve? If we know there's a need, how can I bring love and generosity into that moment? And I believe that if we can learn to pursue these three things, that generosity is a lifestyle, not a moment, the generosity goes against culture. It's going to go against our own hearts sometimes, our own minds. Sometimes giving doesn't make any sense. And then generosity mirrors God's love. We can learn to master these things. And we're going to see in a, like, like I believe that when, 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 when we are generous, and I'm not saying you're not generous. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying when we as cult, corporately come together in generosity, our city can be changed. And our takeaway today is this. Let's learn to live lives of generosity by making it something that transcends what we do and becomes who we are. It's not just about what we do, it's about who we are. That when we see a need, we're moved by compassion to serve. We're moved by compassion to give. 
We're moved by compassion to love and to reach the lost. And you know where we learn this from? We learn this exactly from Jesus, right? The one who gave his life. So I want to give you a challenge for this week. Is that this week, I want to encourage you to give something every single day. So I want to encourage you, when you wake up, ask God each day, reveal to me an opportunity today for me to be generous. You know, it might be as simple as maybe buying a coffee for a coworker. It could be taking a friend out for lunch. It could be trying to get off work early so that you can take your child out on a date. Maybe just a simple day, go to the park. Like, it doesn't have to cost anything. It might be giving your spouse your sleep-in day so they can get two in a row. Imagine. I don't know how you do it in your house, but we don't really get any sleep-in days these days. It's like, I slept in today. It's like seven. It's like, sweet. Maybe for you, that's like late. And for me, like, when I was in high school, it was like noon, one, you know? Now it's like, I, I was like, people who wake up at seven are insane, right? Now I'm one of those people. It might be forgiving debt that someone owes you. You know, I don't know what it might be for you, how you can be generous every day. But again, it doesn't have to be this massive, like, here's a million dollars. It's like, no, like, it has to be small. And the other thing I want to encourage you to do is not, don't tell a single person you did it. You don't have to tell anybody. You can be generous. It's this, it's this thought that might blow your mind. No one has to know. No one has to know when you were generous to somebody. Don't, we don't need to go on Facebook. I was generous today, you know. <laughs> it kind of loses its value, I think, sometimes. So wake up each day. God, reveal to me a moment that I can be generous. How can I be generous today? So I just want to pray for us as it comes to generosity. I know, to be honest, generosity, I think, is one of the spiritual disciplines that's very hard to actually do. Because we're busy humans with limited time and limited money and limited resources. But I believe that God will reveal some very cool moments this week for you to be generous that I think you might even not even understand are possible. So let's pray. God, I thank you, first of all, that you are generous. God, that today, you know, as we even just go through this week and we start to learn how to master generosity, as we learn how to be, live lives full of giving and generosity, God, I pray that, that you reveal to us each day a moment that we can be generous to those in need, that we can be generous to those who are struggling, we can be generous to those who just need a pat on the back. God, help us have eyes to see the need and help us meet the needs that we see this week. So, Father, I thank you that you're guiding us and leading us. And God, we just mirror your love this week. In Jesus' name, amen.